Welcome to the AlphaList podcast. I am your host, Toby. AlphaList is a closed community with over 400 CTOs who share their knowledge and experience in a Slack space and at events. With this podcast, we want to give our members and interested parties insights into the thoughts and ideas of top CTOs. If you're interested in becoming a member of the community, please visit alphalist.com to find out more on how to apply. This episode is again kindly supported by Fastly, the biggest challenger in the CDN market and besides that, a solution I personally use. Fastly is pushing ahead the technical boundaries and is, from my perspective, the best solution on the market. Fastly is one of the key drivers of the edge cloud trend. Well-known customers of Fastly are Shopify, The New York Times, Reddit, GitHub and many, many more. Oh, and one very important thing to notice as I'm talking to Mitchell Hashimoto, the CTO of HashiCorp, the company behind Terraform today, Fastly has built a very good provider for Terraform. So try it out now. So, today I have a special guest and a special topic. Uh, the topic for today is building unstoppable open source organizations. Um, and my guest today is Mitchell Hashimoto. Welcome to the AlphaList podcast. I am your host, Toby. Today with me is Mitchell, um, a guy, I think he's a role model for um, a whole generation of open source developers. Mitchell, can you maybe tell us a bit more about yourself? Sure. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me. And I think I think I looked at who else has joined this podcast. I'd say all your guests are, are special. So I appreciate the call out. But uh, yeah, the, the, you have some amazing guests. Um, yeah. So to tell you a bit about myself, um, I'm the founder of HashiCorp. Uh, we're sort of a company known now for creating projects like Terraform and Vault and Vagrant and things like that. Um, you know, there's depending how you want to count them, there's seven or eight or nine projects. Um, but you know, I think going back, this was a company that started from personal projects, right? Like I started Vagrant, we'll get into this, but I started Vagrant two years before I founded the company and I never planned to found a company that wasn't part of my, you know, goal. Um, and, you know, I really got into this because of my passion for software engineering and open source and infrastructure and bringing that all together. Uh, so, yeah, I think people, uh, you know, I, I hope that I've been a role model like figure in various ways, which is you could work on passion projects and it's an awesome thing. You could build some really cool things, but you could also build companies and, and, and do both. And so, yeah, that's, that's a bit about my history. I think one thing that is, that is really special. I mean, you're now CTO of a large enterprise, I would say, I mean, you have over a thousand employees and if, yes. you, if you, if you look up your name on, on GitHub, then you're quite active still, right? <laughs> yeah, I am. Yeah. How, how do you manage to do that? Sure. Well, okay. So I think the the key there is that we, you know, we are a very large company now, um, but I share the CTO role. I'm a CTO, but my co-founder is also the CTO, Armon. And I think Armon over the years has really taken up more of the uh, business side CTO responsibilities. And I've remained much closer sort of on the engineering side of things. Uh, we overlap, of course, quite a bit, but uh, I spend, you know, a majority of my time uh, talking to the team leads on the engineering and product side. Um, I always embed on new projects, new teams, just as a way to set the base culture, get sort of the initial hiring in process. You know, we have a very heavy written process. and I want to make sure any new teams, you know, get get on boarded with that. Uh, and yeah, that's sort of how we balance it out. And that's sort of why I'm still able to be very active on GitHub, because I'm usually you know, on newer teams uh, helping out. And how did you did you get into into what you're doing right now? What is what is your nerd path? I always call it like that. How did you get get into engineering, and where did you start, and when? Yeah, yeah. So I am one of those people. There's a lot of them, you know, that self taught some basic level of programming when I was around 11 or 12, uh, more so when I was closer to 12. Uh, and my motivation really was. Uh, it's a little bit embarrassing, but I wanted to uh, cheat in video games. Uh, you know, you know, there's games that you know. You remember the Game Shark, probably, and things like that, where you'd enter codes. And I, you know, I always wondered, like, how does this work? Like, 
there was a moment where it just hit me that like these don't just exist this isn't like this this is something that was created a human being somewhere created this and and i like i don't it's it seems like such a basic thought but i i remember just feeling as a 12 year old complete existential confusion about how a human could have possibly made this and that led me to starting to search around the internet uh, and try to figure out how this worked and my parents took me to uh the bookstore and the library and I'd find computer books and I had no idea what I was looking for, but I would just sort of flip through pages and, and say like, Oh, this looks right. And then I'd try to read that page and, you know, just pick things up that way. And then did you, did you study it or did you just go, go for it? And yes, no, I did go to college and studied computer science. Uh, and I did get sort of junior engineering positions, uh, building websites and stuff. And, you know, that's sort of where all the, I would say my junior engineering position, building websites, really kicked off my passion into infrastructure because we we're on a small team and everyone sort of did everything. And so I got that was something I really attached to was infrastructure. And the college side, you know, I, I had student loans. Um, I had, you know, things that I wanted to buy and I didn't, I had a, a job, but it didn't pay very much and I wanted to make more money. And that sort of pushed my entrepreneurship side was the, the college experience was I always was thinking, how could I build? use my engineering skills to build projects to potentially make money. Um, those were the two paths I was taking sort of simultaneously. Then you discovered Ruby and then Vagrant or how did that go? Yeah, so the junior engineering job I just described, we were a Ruby shop. So I learned Ruby that way. Um, and Vagrant was sort of a motivation. So that, that, that company I worked for, I was a consultant and I had a bunch of different projects that I would work on. And it was really frustrating for me to switch projects because they'd have a totally different tech stack or or just versions of like Ruby or databases or whatever would be different and they would affect things. And so I wanted a solution to that. And so uh, Vagrant was sort of my attempt at solving that. And, and it was something, you know, I worked on during nights and weekends and just trying to see if I could solve it. And something I point out to people is, yeah, Vagrant ended up being quite successful. But at the moment when I was making it, there was nothing serious about it. It was just another one of dozens of side projects that maybe I would finish or maybe I wouldn't finish and maybe it would work and maybe it wouldn't work or whatever. And, you know, I, I wasn't, there wasn't a lot of pressure behind it. I was just working on it to see, you know, maybe can I make this better? Um, and and you, you were able to make it better, right? <laughs> I mean, that was... Yeah, I, I think it struck a nerve. Yeah, I think it ended up being... Uh, people liked it for different reasons. And yeah, it ended up being fairly successful. I mean, you see some similarities with, with Docker already in a way, right? So it's... Uh, yep, exactly. Yeah. Why, why did you then not come up with Docker? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think that's an interesting... That's an important point generally, because uh, if you look at the time Docker came out, there were a number of people swirling around how to be more productive with containers um you know I, i was doing stuff for sure with containers before docker i was looking at there was a vagrant lxc um initiative already before docker um and then there are some other projects that were around it and you know i think this is the difference between someone having an idea and someone executing well i think docker was the one who executed the best and they built a good product or good experience out of it and you know they reap the rewards for that um, so, you know, there, this is just a, it's not a pet peeve of mine, but something I always laugh at because a lot of people will see a successful company and not just Docker or something, just anything in the world. And they would say, I thought of that years ago. And it's like, your idea is somewhat valueless. Like it's worth zero, exactly zero. Because an idea that isn't executed is zero value. <laughs> and so, you know, I could say like, oh yeah, I recognize that containers, there was something with containers and I did. But it doesn't matter. So did dozens of other people at the time. Um, Docker just did a really great job and came out with it. But still, if you if you talk to developers, um, some users of Docker are also a bit frustrated these days. Uh, so particularly if you use Docker on a Mac, um, I, I myself yeah. feel the pain sometimes when you're using like an interpreted language like Ruby and you boot up a large Rails project and it takes ages. Yeah. Um, Do you see a way... The same as Vagrant. Yeah, same as Vagrant. <laughs> Vagrant had the same yeah, issue. But, yeah. but do you see... How, how does the future look like uh, there? I mean, I think there's two approaches people are sort of taking. Um, there's the remote, complete remote em development environment approach, right? Where it's cloud hosted or something like that, which 
is interesting. I mean, there's there's companies out there like Coder, um, VS Code Remote, and not a company, but a feature uh, that uh, do do stuff like that. You know, I've I think that could be true, but I haven't yet had a great experience with that. I don't love it. Um, you know, kind of amusingly, the approach I've taken, uh, I tweeted about this recently, but the approach I've taken is moving, getting rid of the shared folder aspect completely. And I've moved my development completely inside a graphical VM. So I use a Mac full time, but I run a very big Linux VM with a window and windowing system installed. Uh, and I, you know, I dedicate three quarters of my CPU and memory to the VM, not to my Mac. And I just work in there, no shared folders, anything. And computers are so fast nowadays that if you don't have that shared folder overhead, you know, that sort of VM experience is maybe 85 to 90% the speed of native. And and that's really good enough even for, I was playing actually with a Rails project a couple months ago and it was it was great. And so I think, you know, I don't think that's the future necessarily, uh, but I, yeah, I think we're in a weird limbo where there isn't a clear answer because there's, that tension and then there's also the tension of microservices and how do you model these things in general like this isn't just a local development question or local versus vm it's just how do you actually model microservice development and that's a challenge right yeah right so sorry i don't have an answer (laughs) (laughs) i don't know (laughs) okay yeah but if you look at microservices then the rails a typical rails project is like in a way the opposite right and yeah, I think David Heinemeier Hansen isn't the biggest fan of of, of microservices anyway. <laughs> yeah, of course, I of course not. Yeah, I go back and forth uh, depending what I'm working on as yeah, well. Okay, uh, maybe a bit more about your, your yourself, like the the the, the private Mitchell. Um, okay. <laughs> so, what, what how do you manage work life balance? Uh, I, I saw like that you recently tweeted that uh, I think the founder doesn't have to be necessarily giving 110% for his company. Um, yep. How do you manage that? Um, I mean, with such a large company that is obviously at a certain point going to IPO and so on. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really important. And I think everyone who says that went through a phase where they, they painfully learned it. I think everyone always says that no one really internalizes it. So maybe I'm just like yelling into the wind or something. But you know, I, it's, there's this misconception, I think, that for a startup to be successful, you must sacrifice everything else other than your company to, to make it successful, or, or at least like, uh, you know, Silicon Valley, like, I don't know, like lies, bullshit. <laughs> <has that. laughs> there's the talk. <laughs> okay, I'll just continue. Marked, there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I mean, I think for me, there was a period of time where I did that um, with my company. And some people might say, well, that's why Oshkorp is successful. But, you know, this was really before this, the products were successful, but this was well before the business being successful. Um, and, and you know, I result, it resulted in what you'd expect, which is sort of a form of burnout, in a sense, um, regrets at, at not doing other things in your life. And luckily, I had this realization fairly young. I think I was like 24 or something. Um, but nowadays, you know, I think it's really important. I tell every new person that I get a chance to talk to who joins HashiCorp, you know, put a, we're remote, but put a start time, end time, and a lunch block, all three in your calendar, like first day of work, talk to your manager about it. I've told all the managers that, so they all support it. Um, it's just really important to have these boundaries and find other things in life because, uh, yeah, it's, they anything could can sort of disappear or not be good at any moment. You have ups and downs. And when there's a down, you have to have other stuff to, to balance it out for you. There is for sure also a reason why you're more, are you more successful when you're intrinsically motivated, right? So I think those, those are different, different topics, right? Right. Yeah. So I think that some people responded when I was talking about that. Um, and, you know, one thing I did say is that when I work, uh, I, you know, on the idea of HashiCorp or things we're doing at HashiCorp, you know, f- five years ago or today, you know, I'm a hundred percent into what I'm doing and I'm, I'm really passionate about the idea that I'm working on. I love it. It's what I love to do. Um, but at the same time, you know, when the day ends, I spent, you know, I cook, I spend time with my family, we watch Netflix or whatever. Like I'm not constantly thinking about that and, and wanting to do that. I, I try to balance it out. 
Okay. And what was your your big HashiCorp growth moment? So I think I, I, I listened to a podcast from, from uh, 2014, I think, where you mentioned that you just have seven people now. How, how did that... How did that go through the roof? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think every company has a few inflection points. And so for us, there were the first one was sort of uh, moving from what my co-founder describes as a well-funded research project, uh, moving from the well-funded research project stage into, into being a business. And we were trying to actually build sales around it and stuff. Um, and the... And that was sort of the first jump. And then the second really jump was when we realized that our business was going to be an enterprise sales oriented business. And that requires a lot of people. And so that's when we sort of hit that second thing. Uh, and that sort of led to today, basically. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think there's, you know, seven people, I would say up to 15 people was the initial like, just engineering push, we hired open source contributors, friends, whoever, and I think everyone except one person was an engineer, we're just building. And then we went from like 15 to about 40 to 50 very quickly. And that was really the initial, let's hire our first few support people, our first few sales people, first few marketing people. And that just adds up really quickly um, while engineering is growing as well. Um, and that gets you to like 50. And then suddenly you sort of have the bits of all the pieces. And then you realize, okay, the foundation is there. Let's open the floodgates and everything. So, you know, sales goes from, three to 30 marketing goes from three to 20 support goes from two to 15 or whatever. And suddenly you're at, you're easily at 125 or whatever. And then that just keeps going. But, <laughs> but everything was triggered through open source, right? So every single product of yours is, is an open source uh, product and, and everything was, was had the, like the inflection point in an in open source, right? Yeah, so everything we commercialize uh, has uh, starts in open source. So, so we're an open core based company, and so everything sort of starts at the open source side of things, uh, and then there's an enterprise version that we monetize later. And you say open core? Can you can you explain how that works? Sure. Yeah. So there's sort of a open source version of our software, and then a commercial version, which is sort of you know I describe it as an internal fork of the project. We take the we take the code base, and due to our licensing, we make sure that all of the um, enterprise stuff is in separate files. You know, there's never a file modified in the enterprise version that's in the open source. They're separate files, whatever, um, that are built into the product to add additional functionality the open source doesn't have. And we charge for that. Okay. And where do you, where's the perfect cut, uh, the perfect yeah. open source, uh, open core enterprise cut? Uh, yeah, there isn't one. I mean, I think, so I think for us, we, the cut was, you know, it's never clean. Um, and that's sort of one of the negative pieces of open core. And we understand that. But uh, I think we picked a pretty good one, which is that we went for the enterprise. So a lot of open source and open core previously, uh, the, the, the obvious thing I think a lot of open source people fall into, or at least used to fall into was, hey, I have a million happy users. How do I get them to pay me a little bit? But you know, my point of view was the, the analogy I made is the people that are using the open source, a lot of them are like the free app versus 99 cent mobile app people. Like the free versus 99 cents is the same as free versus $10. They've already chosen that they're never, ever, ever going to pay for it. They don't want to pay for it. They want the free thing. So it doesn't matter if you charge $10 or 99 cents, the answer is going to be no. And so that's not good for a business. But there's another group of people, which is enterprises, um, medium-sized businesses and, and up that want to pay for things. They're the opposite. Free is scary to them because free means uh, lack of sustainability, lack of support, potentially. This is what goes through their head. Um, lack of influence and the ability to make what they want happen in the product, et cetera, et cetera. And so they shy away from free things. They would, as a business, rather pay for things. And, and so what we said was, that's a pretty large gap, I think, because the if you look at, we looked at the Global 2000, basically, the biggest 2000 companies, the things they want in a product are pretty far from the things that a, a one-person hobbyist or a 20-person company wants. And so I think that helped us make that gap pretty easy. And so to answer your question directly, the way we always described it is the core technology is always free. Vault as a security product 
we don't charge you for security in a sense, right? Like you can build a world-class security project with Vault open source. That's not what we try to make money on. What we make money on is the organizational challenges that are associated with that. So being able to split up policy by team, being able to sync your teams with Active Directory or organizational systems, uh, being able to adhere to, you know, uh, country laws, you know, things like, you know, certain European Union citizen data can't leave certain regions, like it can't go to certain regions. Like, how do you implement that? That's not a, it's not really a security feature. That's a human manifested government politics feature. And so like that we're going to charge for. Um, and that's sort of the, the, pattern we've taken with all our projects. Okay, cool. But maybe like the the first step before um, thinking about uh, open core and how to monetize enterprise, how do I get to 20, 20K stars on GitHub? <laughs> uh, I, I think, you know, I, yeah, the way I always thought about that was I just wanted to build, you know, something that worked um, and something that was usable. And those are two separate things. I think there's a lot of technologists that could build something that works and, and they say like, this is great technology. This is whatever, perfect in some certain way. You know, it's almost like art to them, which is great. But then there's the other side, which is if I don't have a lot of time and I'm trying to solve a problem and I could care less how beautiful your code is, I just want something that works. Like how easy it for, is it for me to use it? And I think that was Vagrant's focus, for example, which is I tried to build something which I was proud of, but at the same time, everyone remembers like it's Vagrant up. That's all you got. That's all you got to know. Just Vagrant up your project. Like you don't need to know how anything else works. Don't understand virtual machines. It's fine. Just run Vagrant up. And I think that focus on usability is a really important thing. Um, and then you know, going past that, it's just listening to users and and building for for more than just yourself. So the first year of Vagrant, you know, I was just building for myself, solving my own problem. And there was a little bit of growth, but it was really when I started listening to other people and building for other people that it grew a lot more because there's obviously people's problems are a lot bigger than my own. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, UX and, and user experience got more and more important for, for open source developers as well, right? Or I, I think it's super important. Yeah, I think people really let it down. And user experience, both in the, the product sense, but also like documentation and getting started guides and things like that, definitely. Um, you know, it's sort of like, it's a boring answer. I, this is a philosophy I've always had sort of in my life, which is sort of like, uh, you know, you just, you just got to do the work every day. There's no, there's no, you know, fast path to success. Some people get lucky sometimes, some people cheat or whatever sometimes, but like, really, like you just have to go to work every day and lay bricks and eventually you build a building, right? Like that's the, that's sort of my mindset behind things. Thanks a lot to our sponsor, The About You Cloud. The About You Cloud offers a full-stack e-commerce solution as a service that runs on exactly the same infrastructure as The About You Shop does. It is mobile-first, can act as a headless system, event-driven, can be fully localized and is super integrated into existing solutions. Besides that, it is designed and developed by a really smart CTO and friend of mine, Sebastian Betts. About You has set up a task force for retailers and brands that want to be quick in the COVID situation. This task force will help you with the launch of your shop, as well as with fulfillment, marketing, support and internationalization. Simply write to hello at aboutyou.com to be supported by this task force. And can you can you do successful marketing campaigns somehow to push your stars on GitHub or? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a lot harder now. This is something that I I, I think about a lot because I don't know. Uh, but when we when I started my open source projects, what we did was we would speak at conferences, meetups, local meetups, and we would travel. Eventually, when we had a little bit more money, we would travel to conferences and talk about them. And that was a great way to get new users and stars and, and visibility. And I don't know if that works anymore because I think something that was really uh, genuine about that approach uh, 10 years ago was that these community conferences were really communities. They were not big companies there. You know, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, whatever, they weren't at these conferences. And so it may, there was a lot of uh, just a feeling of, of genuine sort of sharing happening there. And then I think those big companies, and now we're sort of a big company in that sense, figure that out 
And it's, they sort of, I mean, in my opinion, it's sort of like poison the well a little bit. Like, you know, now these big companies employ developer advocates and they have enough budget to go to literally every single conference, like almost every single conference. You look at any infrastructure conference nowadays and they're sponsored by clouds. They have speakers from those clouds there. They have speakers from venture backed companies there. You know, I, I'm, I'm guilty. Like we're in, we're in this group as well. Um, and I think that makes it harder because obviously there is a there is a form of pitching happening there. They're trying to pitch their own idea, and even if it's a good technology, like I think ours, you know, is for example, there it loses a bit of that spirit of being genuine. And and I think that so I think it's harder to build a community that way now. And you know, it's maybe this existed ten years ago. Maybe I was too small to even know, and I was just naive. But like. There are, we don't participate in this as far as I know, I hope not. Um, but, you know, there are conferences now where they, they, they don't even hide this. They have sponsorship packages. We're in the sponsorship package. You get a speaking slot. It's like <laughs> the conferences I went to didn't do that 10 years ago. Or if they did, they're, the only exception is if they did, there was an explicit uh, sort of like sponsor track. Like it was very obvious it was a sponsor track. But now, they're intertwined in there and maybe it's just an asterisk and it's like in the bottom or whatever. It's hard to figure this out. And I think that really damages the reputation uh, of all these events. So MongoDB kicked it off, right? <laughs> I mean, they, I don't remember. I don't know. <laughs> so I have a little case for you. Um, so a friend of mine is building an open source static site deployment tool, AKA Netlify competitor called Melly. And he's, okay. he's got some very, very basic features, 2,000 stars on, on GitHub and some product hunt exposure, no business model, no no big plans for now. Uh, what what would you recommend as a next step? Uh, so, <clears throat> I mean, 2,000 stars, yeah, I, I wouldn't worry about the business model yet, for sure. I think my focus at that point would be um, how do you become indis an, an indispensable tool for a small subset of people. So uh, for Vagrant, that actually early on, I, I, not anymore, but early on, my focus was create a fantastic Ruby on Rails experience. And that's because that's what I worked on. <clears throat> so I understood it very well. Um, and that's what we did. And that got a bunch of users, but you couldn't use Vagrant well with PHP or whatever. And I think in this case, like if you build a, if you try to build a standard, better static site for everyone, It's going to be really hard and it, they're always just going to compare you to Netlify or what, you know, what a pick, pick your example. But if you say, yeah, we're like Netlify, but really, really good at this one thing, then I think you could get those people and build, build sort of a initial sort of foundation that you could then grow horizontally from. And I, it's funny because I think Netlify is a good example of that. Netlify took the very, very broad uh, cloud services and said, no, we're, we're like, a cloud or we're like a platform like Heroku, but instead of being very general, we're just awesome at static sites. They've really shaved it down and they made a much tighter experience around static sites. Uh, and I think that's really important to get going. My prediction would be if Netlify continues to be successful, that in five or so years, they're going to do a lot more than static sites. Yeah, you can actually start seeing that a little bit. They're getting into like serverless mm -hmm. and some stuff to support API driven stuff. And, you know, that's, That's how it works. They you get that initial base, that initial focus, and you you go horizontal. Okay, is it also the same for your open source project that you, uh, projects that you essentially attract the same user base for for all of those? Yeah, not necessarily the same between products, but we we this is definitely you know I'm I'm giving away in a sense part of our open source strategy here, which is uh, the initial versions build towards focusing on a very specific user or use case. So. Terraform is another example I'll give here, which is, you know, it was hyper focused on AWS. It was basically just a uh, the attempt was a better cloud formation for two or three years. Um, yeah, it supported Google. Yeah, it supported Azure, but like AWS had like a hundred resources that supported, and Google Azure had like ten. And they were really just there to like to proof of concept that you could do multiple providers and stuff. But really, the focus was we want a better cloud formation, and we want to convince every AWS user. To use Terraform, and we did eventually. There's a significant percentage of AWS users that use Terraform, and then we partnered with Microsoft and made Microsoft the huge focus. And then we partnered with Google, made Google a huge focus. And now, it, 
now it does all of them exceptionally well, but like that takes, we didn't start out by trying to do that. We focused really hard. Okay. You just mentioned some some bigger corporates. I think some open source projects are again and again complaining about them essentially doing the business um, after all. So, so yourself building the, the good software and releasing it at open source and um, others um, like then counting the money. Um, do you see that this is also <laughs> also a danger for, for your stuff or... Yeah, I think definitely. I think there's a few differences for us, but but I think to give an example, like I do think Terraform makes cloud providers a lot of money. Like not directly, not 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 sort of directly, but uh, we have some data to back this up, and we, there's there's some partners that we have that completely get it, and there's some that don't. But you know, Terraform makes it easier to adopt cloud, and so a lot more people. Uh, use Terraform and and sort of use more and and there is I can't name them but there is one major cloud that we work with that shared some of the data and they sort of one of the things they looked at was people who use Terraform tend to have I, I don't remember the exact number but it's three or four times more uh, faster growth in cloud usage than people who don't use Terraform and that's really good for our partnership because they started pushing Terraform a lot more they realized that they push Terraform they'll make more money too. We, necessarily, we might not because Terraform itself is free, um, but we have a commercial version as well. Um, but I think the other aspect of it for us is that we're, our sort of value prop as a company is multi-cloud or being cloud agnostic. You know, even if you're not multi-cloud, we will always support you if you ever switch clouds or switch or adopt a new hosting provider or whatever. Like HashiCorp doesn't own the cloud ourselves. So I think that's a value prop that, makes it better for us. And we've had customers tell us, you know, even if uh, a cloud provider offered, you know, Vault as a service, for example, like we wouldn't switch because we want to make sure that we could always replicate with our on-prem database or that we could have the option of adopting another cloud provider. You know, the re the real like we, we withhold sort of the multi-cloud replication feature to our enterprise version. So it's closed source, not open source license. And so if a cloud provider made a Vault as a service, They could build replication on their own, but it wouldn't be protocol compliant with ours. And, you know, legally, it, it really kind of can't be. And so, like, that's something that, uh, you know, we have as a defense in a sense. But I think the most important thing is we've just maintained a really open line of communication with all the cloud providers at all times. And we've asked them, you know, like, there's been times where some cloud providers have said, you know, we're thinking about building this as a service. And we would just say, why? Like, what are you solving for? Are you just trying to make money? Like, is there, do you not trust us to support your customers? Like if, if our customers have a bad time, is that why you, you want control over their experience? Like what's happening here? And we've sort of worked through that successfully so far um, in figuring it out. Okay, thanks. Who recently had some news attention or generated some attention is Shay Bannon and the license change of Elastic. Um, a fantastic yeah. software from my perspective. What what happened and what is your perspective on it? Uh, that's that's going to be hard to answer succinctly here. I mean, um, I think there's a, you dedicate a whole probably series of podcasts to this sort of topic in general, not just Elastic in specific. But um, I mean, I think it's hard. I think, I think there is on one side... You know, I, I'm, I've never met Shay. I've never talked to Shay, actually. Um, but as a creator of open source software, uh, I imagine that he has some sort of feeling that of, of, you know, he wants the community and like he wants to make sure the community is, is healthy and right. Like, I don't think Shay is like an evil person by any means. Um, but at the same time, you know, there's a fiduciary responsibility to the company. And again, I genuinely believe whether this is true or not, that the, the company believes that they had to do this for the good of the company. Um, there's a lot of argument on the internet that they didn't have to do this. They could have been successful in other ways. And, and you know, the, you know, we're sort of all backseat board members right now on the internet for this company. But uh, I, I think they believe that they had to do this. And I think at the same time, they wanted to retain the community and do good. I don't think those are mutually exclusive, um, but they felt cornered in a sense to make this decision. Uh, it's, Yeah, I, I, what happened to it? I mean, I think they felt probably that they deserved in some sense uh, to control the commercial route for their software that they built. Um, I think there's other ways to do it. Maybe, I mean, this is a totally valid option. There's a lot of companies, Elastic's getting a lot of you know, heat over this. And I think that's interesting because there's a lot of other companies that follow the same model that 
don't get a lot of heat over it and are perfectly successful. <laughs> and so uh, it, it, I think there's some aspect of, of noise around this, but at the same time, there's, you know, I think growing companies that are remaining open source licensed and, and doing fine as well. Okay. And in, in his case, it, it um, resulted in a fork, right? So, um, or it's, it's yep. obvious that this would happen. Yep. I, I mean, yeah, that's, it's got to feel bad as my, my, hope uh, my guess you know i i would feel bad if a decision we made resulted in a fork uh, of our software for sure mm. and they obviously also seem to make good money um i mean they have quite generated quite some value yes. in the stock market so um yeah well and this is i i was talking to somebody else and i said you know this is the hard part um you know i could my my when i sit on my open source you know founder side this feels bad um, and I don't want it to do it. And, you know, as a company at HashiCorp, we're not, you know, we're Mozilla licensed. We're not talking about doing this at all. Like that's our current state of things. But when I put on my sort of board member hat uh, of the company, uh, if you look out at all the currently public open source companies that have done this, there has never been any tangible consequence to this ever. MongoDB has only grown. Elastic stock for the first two weeks after they announced this jumped like 10%. Like they, you know, they, they billions of dollars in valuation just jumped up just because of this decision. Um, they, you know, if you look at sort of Redis labs and cockroach DB and sort of things like this that, uh, that don't necessarily have the same license as, as elastic, but they have a, a non open source license now, like they're doing fine. And then there's a bunch of new startups that are yet to be seen how well they'll do as an open source project, but they're just starting from the beginning with licenses like this and they're getting funding and they have a ton of GitHub stars and seem to be doing okay. Um, and, you know, that's the, the thing here is, is a lot of people are saying it's bad and I get why philosophically it's bad. And I don't, you know, I don't feel good about that, but then how are people ever going to make different decisions if they're never, there's no consequences for this decision. And, and then on the opposite, the consequences all the results seem to be positive from a financial perspective and their businesses and that's sort of their responsibility in a sense to be um, positive financially. So um, like that, that's a really tough tension. I think that uh, we'll have to be, we'll just have to see what happens. I, all I could say for now is from my perspective, you know, we're super committed to our Mozilla license and I think our multi-cloud approach and, and our sort of business approach uh, protects us in a sense from from this sort of issue, but um, it's tough for the greater open source community uh, of how we think about future products um, in general. Okay, um, one one more aspect on the on the open source side, um, the the governance of your of your products is that something you keep mm -hmm. for yourself, or is that also do you also openly share that? Uh, so yeah, we don't have like a open governance model in the sense that there's, I don't know, elected members or anything like that. Uh, we sort of firmly have always said that, you know, we're the maintainers of the project. Uh, I think, I think a big part of that is trying to keep an open mind to issues and features that have raised, you know, there's no, I think part of open governance is people have a sort of systemic protection against bad behavior um, or theoretically they do. Um, for our projects, it's sort of like, hey, just trust us that we'll look at your issue and we'll take it seriously and stuff. And I think part of it is we've we've been good uh, uh, good stewards for this period of time. And I always bring that up internally when we talk about it is we have to continue to be good stewards because this is a reputation based game, this open source uh, 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 community management sort of uh, game. And but there is some side where you need some assurances. So we do have partners, for example, with Terraform and so on, where uh, I guess like one example is the open source providers. Uh, we don't govern those at all. Uh, you know, the AWS, Amazon owns the AWS provider. Microsoft owns the Azure provider. Uh, it's in their GitHub orgs. It's they publish it. They whatever. We we have no say. We we just have a. We're basically an open source user at that point. We we could email them and say we would like you to do this, but it's their provider. They could do whatever they want. Um, so I think the way we view it is sort of similar to our open core uh, business model is we, you know, 
tend to sort of run the core as a HashiCorp project without open government governance. It's our project that we run. Um, and But all the integrations, the ecosystem around it, we have very little control over that. And we try to keep that very open. And you also, you also talk very openly uh, about what you're doing, right? I think that's also like part of your secret sauce that um, like if you follow uh, Mitchell on, on Twitter, um, you, you see like who you really are, right? Yeah, I, I mean, I think so. And I think that's the same way with with issues and stuff. Like when we, there's some, been some higher profile for us, like issues where people disagree with the decision we make. And I sort of like, I just try to be very open with why we made that decision and, you know, why it's, there's no conspiracy behind it or anything like that. It's just like, explain it. And I think, you know, people will disagree. Like, you know, we disagree in some things that the community wants and, and they disagree with some things that we want. And it, I think that's going to be the nature, whether you have open and governance or not. Um, uh, yeah. You seem to have a lot of, of followers in the way of, or um, let's say you're a role model for a lot of people. Uh, do you have any role models yourself, like people you follow, you trust, um, and and you 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 uh, listening uh, to a lot? Um, yeah, I mean, definitely. I don't. I would say like it's no single people that I like look at everything they ever write, but I mean, I there's a lot of people out there that I respect in different ways for what they're doing. I mean, I think from a I've brought this up before, but from an engineering perspective. Uh, the project lead for the go programming language uh russ cox like i think i think he's brilliant i think the way he's running go is is mostly great and and there's a lot to learn from there and it's you know everything he says and writes i definitely read because i think his approach to thinking about things um i could learn a lot from it and so i i tend to read it and i don't just read it and what he thought i try to read it and think how did he get here like why did he think this way um, I think that's interesting. Uh, yeah, I mean, other people, I don't, I'm not sure how to name them. I mean, I, I definitely follow people like DHH on Twitter. You know, there's things that I'm sure he would despise about me. There's things I disagree with what he says, but I, but still, like, I think that my, the role models I tend to have are sort of somewhat contrarian, I guess, because I tend to like to think, how did they think this way? Like, why did they think this way? Um, there must be some merit to it and I could be wrong and I probably am wrong in a lot of cases. And that's what I really enjoy doing. And I think that's how I got to where I was too, which was, you know, like I said, the user experience thing back in Vagrant was sort of, I'm not just going to build a good technology. I think there's a lot of focus on really good technology. I'm going to think differently and try to build something that's more user focused or whatever in an infrastructure tool, which was at the time very, very rare. Um, and I think I continue to try to find like what are ways I could think differently today that give me an edge or you know change things potentially. So one thing I I also like as a as a takeaway in this podcast is that I I typically like to recommend tools and I like CTOs that also recommend tools. So <laughs> do you have anything uh -huh. that totally blew your mind in the last months where where you talk about to your friends? which in my case, for example, is Metabase or Airtable. I really like those tools. Uh, do you have something that makes you way more productive and gives you superpowers apart from Go? Sure. I, okay, okay. I mean, I think there's there's two. There's one that's super technical and then there's one that's really user-focused. So I think the user-focused one that I've been pitching to anybody who will listen is uh, this Mac app called CleanShot Pro. It's just a screenshotting tool, but I think they nailed the they nailed the user experience and I use it like, five times a day. Like it's, it's just important in my work. I, I, I so. actually bought it yesterday when I saw it on Twitter <laughs> on your, yeah, on your okay. Twitter okay. feed. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. I don't have a referral code. I'm not an investor, nothing like that, but it's, I've never even talked to the, the people who made it, but yeah, it's, it's a great tool. I use it. I, no joke. I use it every day, five times, at least a day. Um, a lot of the stuff I post on Twitter was from clean shot. Um, so that one's great. Um, the super, super technical thing that I've really adopted, I think it's really raw. It needs a lot of work from a usability standpoint, but it's really powerful is Nix. Um, so the VM that I run uh, is a Nix OS VM. Uh, prior to running the VM, I used to run Nix directly on Mac, although that's kind of tricky, uh, but it's super powerful. I think one of the ways you could see it happen in a lot of our projects, will have a shell.nix file. And what that's doing is basically, I have it set up with my computer that when I, CD into the directory of that repository, 
it loads the full dependencies required for me to work on that project. So like the Go versions, any environment variables, uh, specific, yeah, specific separate tools that I need, uh, compiler helpers, whatever. Um, it's pretty magical. And and we've there's other people on our team who don't really use Nix. They just have it installed so it it works. And they said it's pretty amazing to be able to get pull or check out a different branch that's using a different version of Go. And it just like appears, right? That's the Go that's now on their path. Um, so it's sort of like it's sort of like a Ruby version manager or Node version manager or anything on steroids because it's for every single piece of software you can install. Coming to one more question. So I think 11 years ago, um, you did your first commit to Vagrant, um, I read, and you barely knew what virtualization was back then. Um, yep. And did your first steps in Ruby. Now I have a little surprise for you. So I found a hidden secret in in, in Git. Um, it was a secret <laughs> you built in Git and it, it, it allows you to travel back in time um, to a certain commit. And um, I now open up my shell and bring us back to that very, very moment when you committed your first commit for Vagrant. And we can now observe you for a little while. Um, and you now have the chance to, to whisper something into, into young Mitchell's ears. What, what would it be? <laughs> uh, I think I, I don't want to, I wouldn't want to say too much. I mean, I think I would just say, I think I would just encourage myself. I think I would just say like, all I would say maybe is you're on the right track or something. You know, I think, I think the mistakes that I, anyone makes that, but I made the mistakes that I made, uh, the poor decisions, you know, I made and the right decisions I made all has to happen for, for me to learn and become whatever it is today. Like, could it, could it have been done better? Probably. But like, all I know is what happened to, for me in this path today. And so I think I wouldn't want to mess that up too much. I would just try to say like, just a little bit of encouragement because there was definitely a lot of anxiety at various times. I think I would just say, you know, like, you're on the right track. That's good. Very good closing words. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll see that you are on the right track, I guess. Um, and uh, I hope so. <laughs> look, looking, looking forward to see what, what HashiCorp is, is doing and uh, how you develop, what you, what you come up with next. So hope to have you again on the podcast in a year or so. Sure. And maybe, of course. maybe at a certain point, whenever traveling is, is possible again, um, visit you over there. Yeah, looking forward to see you again. Thanks a lot. I am too. Thank you very bye much. Bye-bye. Thanks again to our sponsors, Fastly and the About You Cloud. If you want to know more about Fastly services, simply visit fastly.com slash alpha list. If you want to get in touch with About You and hear more about the About You Cloud, simply write to hello at aboutyou.com. Thanks a lot.